My name is Bernie Lowe from CNBC uh, Asia. I live in Hong Kong. Our network is all over the world, though, and I'm very pleased to be all with all of you in Tianjin today. You are part of a reality, a real-life reality TV experience today. How many of you have done reality TV before? Very few, right? In an audience, have you ever done that before? I know a lot of you have gone to these sessions, you know, where people talk and exchange ideas. But we're actually going to go beyond the borders of the session today. And we are going to rebroadcast it. It's going to be played out on CNBC the following uh, weekend. So for that reason, you're going to feel and hear a lot of TV uh, sort of things going on uh, today. You know, normally when we have interactive sessions, we just start and we go all the way to the end and we let the audience participate, and then we say bye bye, and then we all clap our hands politely. But we're actually going to stop and start and stop and start. A few times because we have these things uh, on the TV called ad advertisements, or we hope we have uh, these things that we call ads, which keep the TV station going, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, so from time to time, I'm going to rudely interrupt this discussion, which is which promises to be very involved and very invigorating, and I'm going to say we'll be right back or something like that. Okay, and I say when we return, we'll talk about blah 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 blah. Okay. And then if you hear, and then we'll be back in two or something like that. When I say we'll be right back, I want you all to go. <laughs> okay, because it looks really good on TV. It looks like it's very exciting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it all on you right now, okay? Uh, let's pretend we're at the end of 10 or 15 minutes. Folks, when we come back, we're going to talk about China versus the United States. Can there be only one superpower? That's when we return. All right. Very, very good. And that's all you need to do, okay? We're going to do that three times, and the last time you clap, we're going to unlock the doors and you actually get to go out, okay? <laughs> It'll go by very, very fast, okay? All right, we're going to start in a few seconds here. Uh, the voice of uh, God or Allah or whoever is going to say a few things sort of to set up the stage, and that's how the program will start on TV. So what you see on these two big monitors here is what is actually going to go on the program, and that'll be the very start of it. Uh, the lights will go down from time to time, uh, that's just for visuals, you know, so it's a little cleaner and neater. Don't get scared. We're not having power failures. The Tianjin municipal government would never, never let that happen during a World Economic Forum, okay? So the lights will go on and off a little bit, okay? A few breaks here. Remember, I want to practice it one more time because if you miss it, I'm going to look really, really bad on TV. We'll be right back with more from the World Economic Forum. All right. Yes, okay. Here we go. Funny. No, in, in, in Martin, we haven't started yet. Hmm, I think everybody knows we're about to start except the TV guys. <laughs> they were just uh, putting some last touches on the, uh, on the timings over here. By the way, I have a question for you. Um, one of the most difficult parts of any uh, seminar forum, meeting like this, we get very nervous as moderators near the end when we ask, we'd like to open it up to members of the audience to engage our participants and then Six times out of ten, I go, anybody? 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 How many of you are pretty sure you'd like to address some of these people up here on the, on, uh, on the stage? Do I have people? I mean, early on? <laughs> One, two, three. We're going to send you a, a CNBC peacock if you, uh, if, in, the, in a lucky draw if you ask one of the questions. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Shut up, Bernie. All right. Here we go. <laughs> China at the crossroads, slowing growth in the world's second largest economy, which expanded 7.6% in the previous quarter, its slowest pace in three years. But just how bad is the slowdown? And at a time when growth is slowing both at home and in its key export markets, Beijing is making efforts to transition its export-oriented growth model to one that's more driven by domestic consumption. Plus, 
a once in a decade leadership change. What do the transformations in the seven and a half trillion dollar economy mean for the rest of the world? Over the next hour, we'll discuss and debate. China, the road ahead. Weighing in on our discussion, Li Dao Kui, director of the Center for China in the World Economy. Li Kai Fu, chairman and CEO of Innovation Works. Arvind Subramanian, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Klaus Kleinfeld, chairman and chief executive officer of Alcoa. And Martin Soro, chief executive officer of the WPP Group. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, CNBC's Bernie Lowe. Hello, everybody, from beautiful Tianjin, China, at the World Economic Forum. I am your friend, moderator, MC, and host, and all of the above, Bernie Lowe. The title of the forum today and the questions that we will delve into, China, the road ahead, is at both times a loaded question and a very, very open, wide open concept. We're going to talk through a number of dimensions as they pertain to the future of the People's Republic in an hour of power-packed discussions and very, very deep thinking. I can guarantee you that. I've been doing this more than 20 years and we do have a panel that is going to achieve everything that we hope for today. We'll talk about where China is. There's been a lot of debate over the past day or two uh, about where they are. Is China going to be the savior for the world? or is it facing a slowdown that's going to drag everybody else along with it? We'll talk about the transition to being a market economy, uh, the usual perennial questions like currencies. We'll also talk, aside from hardware, about the software in China, the people factor, lifting up the aspirational uh, portion of the population, and, of course, politics. You cannot avoid politics in a year like 2012. We've got major political transitions in the powerhouses of the world the PRC, and the USA. You've been introduced to your panelists for our session today, and I'd like to start off with somebody who has no lack of opinion when it comes to things in the PRC, and then I can guarantee you it's going to be the wild, wild west here at the WEF because we're opening it up. There's no plan. It's unscripted, and it is by the pulse. Martin Sorrell, good to see you again, my friend. You want me to be combative on this, do you, I want you to tell me what is going on. I didn't like the introduction at all to be combative. You didn't like no, it? No, not at all. Because now, it, why is that? It implied China I spent was, a lot of time on that. It, it was implying China was slowing down. In our experience, China is not slowing down. Uh, I would agree that the, there is a, a, a question about what is going to happen with the new Politburo, the new leadership, and there is some uncertainty around that, and we're waiting to see who's nominated and then who's ratified in March, and that six-month period will be a hiatus as well. But how can we, how can we uh, criticize in the West uh, an economy that in our case uh, is growing by 15.5% in the first seven months of this year mm -hmm. at a time when GMP growth is 7, 7.5%? When Jibao yesterday confirmed they will hit, the CEO confirmed they will hit the numbers, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, so I think it's really wrong for us to be critical. And I had a conversation with one official here when I was talking about uh, the, the room that Mario Draghi has given us in Europe with uh, his recent moves uh, and talking about quantitative easing and there was a smirk and a, uh, and a chuckle. We have got ourselves into this situation, not the Chinese. And I think one of the issues that we in the West have to deal with is explaining to the Brazilians, the Russians, the Indians and last but not least the Chinese what mistakes we made rather than what mistakes they made. Mm -hmm. uh, I have great confidence in the political leadership here. They are to date all engineers, I think, in the Politburo, and there may be something in yeah. having engineers running the country, and state-directed capitalism works. And okay. the irony of this mm -hmm. is that we're moving in the West to a more, a more state-directed system. We're trying to embrace, you look at Vince Cable's words yesterday in the UK, mm -hmm. he's trying to get more government intervention in terms of the way the economy is written. So okay. I think the basic premise is wrong. Mm -hmm. China is slowing down from some of the growth, but 12 five year plan is about higher quality growth, switch to consumption, right. healthcare, social security, safety net, and last but not least, right. from our point of view, greater service in the place. Okay, Sir Martin Sorrell says stay the course, and he is an obviously, obviously a consummate China bull. I'm going to swing it to this side, uh, Professor Subramaniam. Uh, you know, Martin is saying don't look east, look west. How do you reply? Well, I, I disagree with, with Martin uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I think uh, seven and a half is much slower than the 10, 10 and a half that China achieved over the last 30 years. Uh, that's one. That's just a fact. Uh, you know, 
we can go into who's responsible for that, uh, i.e. whether it's the Americans or the Europeans or the Chinese or the Indians, but the fact is that this is an, uh, the world economy has turned down, and as a result, China, which is integrated with the world economy uh, in a way that few economies are, uh, are paying the price for that. That's point number one. Point number two, it is not true that the quality of growth has been as good as the 12th plan wanted. Uh, we're, we're not only seeing uh, growth slowing down, but although China has rebalanced in the sense of relying less on exports than before, you know, the current account balance came down from 10, now to about 3%, but there's an internal imbalance, which is that China is still doing a lot of investment, you know, just throwing money at building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what that has done is it has not improved consumption. It is not, I mean, all this, all this is relative. It has okay. not improved employment as it should have. Right. And above all, what is politically a little bit alarming is that the share of the pie going to people as opposed to the well-connected and capital mm -hmm. has been coming down. Okay. Professor Suranian, let me uh, swing up uh, to uh, somebody who knows industry, the uh, company that's first to report on Wall Street because of, by virtue of their ticker symbol. You are not upset at China at all. You sell what? 45, almost 50 percent? Uh, you buy, uh, 45, 50 percent of your product to China. You have absolutely no, no complaints about the PRC, do you? Well, let's so. clarify a couple of things. We're reporting first, not because of our ticker symbol, but because we close the books first, <laughs> right? So that's, that, that's, the reason, that's the reason why. And if you want to invest, AA is our ticker symbol. So secondly, I mean, 40 plus percent of world's demand for aluminum is here in China. But I think I, w I would agree with, with, with Martin's optimistic view. When you look at the policy, the stated policy, there is a clear plan there how to change the economy. In the short term, which is a five-year plan, and even in the long term, which is a 30-year plan, it has clear components, upgrading the, the economy, making a sustainable ecological growth. The real issue is how to match that with the realities. And that's what we see every day. You have an aluminum industry here, although... Mm -hmm. You really don't have the foundation, a very good foundation for an aluminum industry here. There's no bauxite here. Sixty percent of the bauxite gets imported. Hmm. There's a lack of energy here, and most of the energy that is produced is coal-fired energy, which is a very dirty energy. So the whole industry is extremely expensive. Nevertheless, we see continued build-outs, right, for mainly for the reason of this being state-run firms, some local subsidies. So the real question is... How is the transformation from a great plan, the 12th five-year plan, mm -hmm. to the realities? And, and that would require a couple of important chunks. There is a tremendous need for more small and medium-sized enterprises. And there's a tremendous need for changing the financial system to make that happen. Today, the realities are, is if you're a state-run company, a large company, you pay about 1% to 2% interest rate on a loan. Mm -hmm. If you're a private company, you at least double the amount. Right? That's a problem, right? If you're a state-run firm, you can, in our industry, many are unprofitable today. More than, more than we believe, more than one-third of the capacity here is unprofitable in China mm -hmm. these days. Right. Nevertheless, they don't shut down. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because provincial governments keep them afloat for a while. Mm -hmm. For a while. Mm -hmm. Market dynamics, in the end, will kick in, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. And at the same time, mm -hmm. net resources are misused. Right? And that's the issue. Okay. Now, Klaus Kleinfeld, uh, Lee Kai Fu has been talking about the need for innovation, the need to really enable and empower the small and mid sized enterprises. Innovation is, the in is, is your chosen industry. And throughout your various titles, your various companies which you've uh, worked with, you've been working to really make that happen uh, in China. Do you, how, do you fall in the camp on this side? I'm, I'm finding the left, I'm sorry, to my, the people on my left here, yeah. uh, you know, seeing more, positive, uh, more positives than negatives, and maybe a little more cautious on this side, at least from Professor Subramanian. Well, I think numerically, both sides make sense. There used to be much larger growth, now there will be smaller growth. And I think more importantly is the, the, the transition in the quality of change. Because as uh, China goes from, say, 9 to 7.5 percent, what's really not happening is everything's slowing down by 1.5 percent. But some of the pre-existing manufacturing, export, and service industries are slowing down by perhaps more than that. The question really becomes, can the small, medium businesses, can the innovative businesses, can the companies building products uh, grow a lot more than that? to create a healthy um, seven and a half or hopefully a higher number. Mm -hmm. And certainly from my perspective, my company Innovation Works, we invest in early stage high tech companies. Uh, we are very optimistic and, and bullish about that uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I think the, uh, there's generally a misunderstanding of what innovation means. 
people generally say, well, China probably won't have an Apple, uh, Apple computer, that is. Uh, therefore, it's not going to catch up. But I think that's really uh, the wrong question. The question is, can China build solid, useful products that its people will use and drive up consumption? And in the area of mobile, internet, e-commerce, cloud computing, and we're seeing that in space, that people are being innovative, they're building useful products, um, and the growth is astronomical. Many companies we have are, you know, in two, three years, are reaching 100 million users. So that part's going really well, and I, I'm confident that kind of useful product, you may or may not say that's innovative enough, will pick up whatever... Um, uh, deficit is made by the manufacturing service and export. Mm -hmm. and, and lastly, I would say the government has played a very positive uh, stimulus uh, uh, role in making that happen. Uh, they are able to provide um, assistance in terms of attracting talent, uh, in terms of tax uh, reductions, in terms of um, co-investing in venture capital funds, um, and doing it in a very hands-off way mm -hmm. that lets the experts do what they do best. Okay. We're actually delving into a lot of different perspectives here, obviously. You know, the need for innovation. There, there is, there's obviously this overriding sense of a need to restructure uh, the economy. I mean, the capital, uh, uh, capital allocation, resource allocation is not optimized right now, but it's still at early stages. Uh, there are uh, as part of the opening here, you know, can you weigh in? You've heard from the other four panelists, the other four participants here. Where, you know, what, what, what have you heard so far, and can you help us synthesize where we are in this discussion? Well, I'm based in China. My research is about the, mostly about the Chinese economy. So for me, I have no luxury for being optimistic or pessimistic. The only choice for participants in the Chinese economy is to be pragmatic. So in my eyes, in my eyes, we still have 1.3 billion hungry population. Mm. Being hungry, I mean that they are willing to work hard to improve their living standard, to grab any opportunity to, to do better in the future. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is that there are many, many, many problems to be resolved. Perhaps the coming three to five years would be the most critical for the coming 20 years for the type of the market economy we are going to be. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many problems. I can bore you with days of discussion of the problems in China, mm -hmm. but now I can say that, summarize, in my eyes, two basic problems. Mm -hmm. One problem is domestic. Domestically, we still have a lot of institutions which are not conducive to creative activities, mm -hmm. to investment activities, to environmentally friendly practice. Can you name one we have to, can you name one Certainly, for rule of law, for example. The independence of the court, very important in order to resolve disputes about property rights, in order to dispute even, even controversies in the media, lots of problems, social problems, to dispute problems about land acquisition mm -hmm. or conversion of land use. Tremendous social problems can only be fundamentally resolved by an independent and a functioning court system. So that is one. Right. That do is we, one, we, one let, area. Let me jump in there just while we're, we're fresh on that thought. Um, a reform of the legal system, reform of the judicial system, I, you know, it may be part of the midterm or longer term plan, but it falls behind because right now everybody's focused on, will they hit 7.5? Will they hit 8? Will it be seven? If they're lower than seven, does that mean the country is falling off a, a hill or something like that? When talking about China, and I, bl I would blame the media, a lot of the lamestream media for this, is a, a very, very severe chronic case of GDP-itis. I mean, a fascination and an obsession with top-line numbers instead of some of the factors. And we will get into these that you're talking about here. Am I, I right? Fully or am I, am I, I fully, fully agree that too much attention is fixed upon GDP or the growth rate, right? Which... I can, frankly speaking, we can easily check up. 0.5% very easily check up. The key issue is fundamentals of growth mm -hmm. for the coming two decades or three decades. Whether China will be able to become another developed East Asian countries like Japan or Korea, or whether China will end up with another Latin American economy. I'm sorry for people from Latin America, but this is a fact. They are only 35% per capita wise, per capita income wise of the U.S., mm. whereas our East Asian neighbors are 75% of the U.S. per capita income. Now, another thing I should quickly add, in addition to domestic problem, mm -hmm. is international problem. Mm. I do see, I do see over the past one, one and a half years that they are enhanced, their enhanced anxiety about China, especially 
among our neighbors. That is, that is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. That can provoke domestically our super uh, irrational okay. nationalism, which in turn will hamper, okay. will, will impede our domestic reforms. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you for setting the stage. We will be right back. Uh, obviously, we are going to be talking about a lot, about a lot of things. We broached innovation. We brought, uh, broached the uh, restructuring of the economy, big versus small versus middle size, and the concept of bullying when it comes to China, whether China's doing the bullying or somebody's bullying back. We'll be back with more of China, The Road Ahead, brought to you by CNBC Asia and the World Economic Forum in just a couple minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very nice. Great crowd. Oh, wow. All right. Um, we're just going to take a minute. I think the audio people, do you want to check? Yeah, I think we've got one. Uh... But you said it's easy to jack up the economy. It's easy to jack up the number or is it jack up the I mean, investment. Oh, sure. Real. <laughs> number is even easier. Number is even easier. Are we up? Oh. Is the audio up? Is it broadcasting? Okay. May? May. Is everybody else okay? We're all okay. This is another thing we don't do uh, unless we're doing a reality TV show. You normally don't see six men getting makeup on, on a stage either. That's <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> Folks, we're going to try something, by the way. I've asked you to clap three times. I'd actually like, like you to do it a few more times. When the lights come up and it's really bright, again, if you could just give me a round of applause and welcoming back, it's going to, it'll make it seem like The Price is Right or one of the TV game shows that we grew up with. Welcome back. You are watching China the Road Ahead, brought to you by CNBC Asia in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. Well, one thing was sh for sure, uh, you ask five people uh, their opinion about China and you essentially get five different opinions because we certainly haven't achieved uh, consensus uh, thus far uh, in the program. We've set the stage. We've talked about, uh, you know, the, the rise of the small and uh, middle-sized enterprises, where China's role is, not just uh, economically, but socio-politically in the world. Let's get back to the gentleman who helped us open uh, this session, because he's been raising his hands a lot, and he's got a I few opinions. I once at the end, because I wanted to correct this Latin American point that was uh -huh. just made. Um, very unfair brickbat at Latin America. Latin America is on uh, a growth spurt as well. In fact, if I look at our first seven, eight months, Latin America actually outperformed China, uh, particularly Brazil, growing at about 16 or 17%. And Latin America itself has take off. This is a, 
I mean, the whole thing we're talking about, Bernie, I think is a historical shift that we in the West find very difficult to come to terms with. The US, the UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain to take it, find it very difficult to stomach the, the, the rise of the East and the South, meaning Latin America, mm -hmm. and the Southeast, meaning Africa and the Middle East. Right. These are regions of the world that for 200 years have not been moving in the right direction. In the early 19th century, China and India was 50% of worldwide GNP. It will, according to Jim O'Neill and Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs, at some point in time in the very near future, be 40 or 50% of world G GNP again. We will not be the top dogs in Western Europe, and that's the uncomfortable truth mm -hmm. that we're increasingly coming to terms with. And I just want to come back to the 12th five-year plan. It did set the stage, and, and I find it amazing that the Western press didn't cotton on to the 12th five-year plan until two years after it was announced. Mm -hmm. I remember coming to the China Development Forum here and hearing Wen Jibao explain the 12th five-year plan almost two years ago, explain the need for a different type of growth mm -hmm. to maintain social harmony, which is a critical issue, yep. critical political issue, and drive the economy forward. So uh, I think, again, we, 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 we misreport it for sensationalist reasons. We misreport it because we're insecure now in a world that is increasingly dominated by forces that were not as dominant a right. few years ago. Okay, but it is one thing, though, isn't it, Mr. Kleinfeld, to talk, the talk, right? Two years, if it takes the media two years to pick up on the theme, maybe it's because you're not acting on your talk. You want to weigh in here? No, you no, are I not would actually, I would actually say, <laughs> I would actually say, and you started off with that, if there's a country that has usually been following their talk you know, extremely well in the last 20 years is China, you mm -hmm. know, and I think you can really uh, take it to the bank. The five-year plan is usually reached earlier than the five years are over, you know, so I have great confidence. But also keep in mind, we are going through a very unique phase in the history of China. We're going through a, a historic leadership change, you know, that really only happens every decade, mm -hmm. you know, and you see, I mean, some of the things that are happening around that. So in a way, I think in the, on the execution of the plan, the plan, by the way, is extremely good. It's extremely smart. It has all the right things. It has, a, it has visionary power because it transforms the country into a higher value add country, bringing more people into urban environments, industrializing them, giving them the opportunity for v wages to rise, giving them the opportunity to be part of what we in the West have enjoyed for many years. Mm -hmm. That's what David Lee just uh, said, said, said also. I think that's very good. Now, the big question is, how do you start the action in a time when you go through this gigantic leadership transition? So in a way, I would say currently we're probably two years behind in the execution, mm -hmm. right? And it might take another year, you know, and I'd love to hear the view of the Chinese side, you know, there. It might take another year until the power really comes in. At the same time, we have mounting issues. We have mounting issues, some we describe in our industry. When you look at heavy industry these days, mm -hmm. which is in the five-year plan seen as an industry that should be reduced, and for good reason. I mean, 41% of the energy is consumed in this country by the five top heavy industries, although these industries only have 2% of the total employment mm -hmm. of the country, right. right? If you look at the rivers, 40% of the rivers are polluted to a level that there's no drinking water that you can take out of mm -hmm. it, right? You look at the fine particle count in Beijing, on average 100, mm -hmm. Los Angeles is at 14. Mm -hmm. So you are seeing some aspects, you know, mm -hmm. which are critical, which are reaching critical marks. Mm -hmm. All of that is addressed in the five-year plan. The real question is when can the central forces take over again and, and, and supplement the market forces, mm -hmm. oh. uh, right? But the, the general ideas, I think, are absolutely right, okay. absolutely right. Arvin, I'm going to come back to, uh, Arvin, I'm going to come back to you before I uh, let uh, Dao Kui and uh, Kai Fu into the conversation, because I know you're eager but, to comment I mean, on this. I think uh, what is uh, critical about the present is you're getting a, a combination of a number of factors. One, as you mentioned, you know, the leadership transition. But I think there are two other, I think, really important kind of shifts taking place. One is, and that's what I think the opening video alluded to, is that China's strategy for growth, the development model, uh, there are now questions about that fundamentally. You know, externally oriented, growth oriented, you know, does that have to change? You know, that's a fundamental question. And how will that happen? A related, I think, point, let's not be too coy about it, is that in the last one or two years, there have been some serious, serious doubts, at least in the last six months, some serious doubts about uh, the legitimacy of 
uh, uh, you know, the Communist Party. Let's, let's not be coy about that because, you know, there have been corruption scandals, there have been, you know, uh, all, all, the, all this the kind of shenanigans that have been going on. So, so the, the old view that, you know, you know, the Chinese leadership just has to deliver growth and all will be okay, I don't think that's fundamentally true. There is this big challenge of delivering growth and consumption and employment and all of that, but there's also this associated challenge of, you know, the institutions will have to change, as you were saying, you know, uh, uh, you know political institutions, democratic, in, economic institutions, and so on. So, so one big, I think, question going forward is, is it possible to reorient the growth model towards consumption, the quality of growth, without uh, some accompanying political change? But hold on a second. Corruption and inequality are two issues that we have to deal with in the West as well. I mean, this is some Martin, Martin that, that, not, this, this is, is not a, this a not Chinese a, This is not problem, a compare it? fest, Martin. Yeah. It's not a compare fest. We're talking about China. The I mean, for everything you say, the West was, a, you know, a needs to adjust. Of course, that's true. The point is that China has challenges domestically, regardless of who brought it about or regardless of whether other countries are facing the problem. And the central problem, it seems to me now, is that if you have to reorient towards a consumption-oriented strategy, can you do that without taking on the vested interest in the economy? It's not a consumption-oriented strategy. I mean, the 12th five-year plan does not talk about a consumption-oriented strategy. It talks about a higher value-add strategy. The consumption, in my view, comes automatically. The more you give people, the more they can consume, right? But, but, the, but the, 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 the program basically says we first have to give them more. We have to raise the general level. Right, and that is the, and the real critical thing there is to get more private industry there, to mm -hmm. get the entrepreneurship there. And to get that done is super critical because so far the, the, the pendulum has in the last five, seven years has swung into the opposite direction. The state-owned the state enterprises have played more of a role here in mm -hmm. bringing the economy forward. That has to change. That right. is an unbelievably fundamental change. All right, let me bring Kai Fu, let me bring Kai Fu into this conversation. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether consumption is, or, is really that desirable or not. We're having an actual, actual mm -hmm. debate about uh, you know, what the, you know, whether it's implicit in the 12 five-year plan or is it sort of a, an end effect. I mean, you talk, you talk specifically about yeah. creating things that people will want. You're creating a need, not filling a need necessarily. Well, I believe the Chinese consumers, having had less um, time in selecting products than, the, say, the American consumers, are probably not as aware of what they want. So smart companies will have to go a little bit farther out mm -hmm. than just to do focus groups and understand, mm -hmm. but maybe to anticipate a little bit that if I build this, would you? it's not so much as to... Uh, to say, no one wants this, I'm going to create it and surprise mm. you. Right. And it's also not quite, tell me what you want and I'll build it. It's more like, if we build this, would you want it? You do. Okay, we'll build it. So I think that kind of model of fulfilling consumption can be a very good way to innovate, not so far out as the Apple Steve Jobs kind of thing, mm -hmm. but also not just um, uh, reinventing the wheel and building the same things. But I did want to uh, address Arvind's other point about the political issues and stability. Um, that's not my expertise, but um, I'm very active on social media, so we certainly see a lot of discussions about that as well. Um, I would say that uh, certainly the corruption is a big issue, and some of it has become public to the world, and some of it is discussed at a local level on social media and the like. Uh, it is a significant issue, but at the same time, I think the, the role of social media has been phenomenal. It's brought up a lot of these things to the open so that I think the parts of the government that needs to address and deal with it True. understands that, hey, these things are, these social media are very powerful and we need to pay attention to it. So I think smart uh, bureaucrats and government officials will move forward with uh, the, the right steps to, uh, to, to reduce the corruption, increase the transparency, mm -hmm. which I think are the enough of first steps for, to satisfy the constituents to, so, so that this um, domestic consumption and the five-year plan can move forward. Right. Now, Craig, you know, one of the most interesting uh, themes that came out during that uh, very drawn out and very high profile, you know, uh, uh, incident, and it's not over yet, in, involving Chongqing, uh, you know, power chief, uh, Bo Xilai, was uh, people took a second look, you know, at the, uh, the people who hold power in China. And then, you know, we did some cross, uh, cross comparisons in the media, and we realized, wow, 
Being in politics in China is quite capitalistic, actually. It can pay <laughs> off in, in big dividends. You know, when you look at the kind of uh, wealth they amass compared to what happens in many Western uh, countries. Now, you know, we seem to be veering toward innovation and, you know, kind of gauging what people's desires are. And I found what Kai Fu said very interesting, that the Chinese haven't had the same amount of time or the same uh, time horizon as Americans to know really what they want. You know, when I go back to the West and I go shopping, there's too much of every, everything, period. So I don't know if that's the opposite side of the problem. But what, what, where are we right now with this discussion in terms of innovation and, uh, you know, creating, creating a need where a need doesn't, doesn't necessarily exist? Well, I think the fundamental issue is not with our consumers. Consumers in China, I think, are equally smart as their American or Western counterparts. The problem in general are not also with our entrepreneurs or enterprises who are in general also extremely creative and industrial. The problem still with our institutions. If you compare today's China with what it was 10 years ago, I think it's a good comparison, right? 10 years ago, people were, if we had our conversation 10 years ago, we would be discussing about WTO. Mm -hmm. What would WTO happen to China? Mm -hmm. Will it wipe out our automobile industry. Well, China's whole manufacturing industry be wiped out, mm -hmm. right? The, today's discussion is different. What's different? The, the difference is that 10 years ago, China just had a round of fundamental institutional reforms. WTO, state owned enterprises reform, and reforms of uh, uh, land conversion, of reforms of public finance, so on and so forth. So in the past 10 years, especially in the past maybe uh, 15 years, uh, uh, right? China benefited from the dividends of institutional reform pushed out by the previous government, right? the government before this one. However, today, we are facing a problem that we're running out of the dividends of institutional reforms. Mm -hmm. So China is at a stage that in order to continue to grow, we have to have a new round of institutional reforms. And these reforms are dealing with burning questions, burning issues. For example, stock market. Mm -hmm. Our stock market is now having negative 20, per, easily 15% growth this year. Whereas our economy is growing 7.8% mm -hmm. in the first half of this year. Mm -hmm. Whereas US, 3% mm -hmm. growth GDP and 15% uh, of uh, NASDAQ, well, 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 uh, right? uh, NASDAQ index. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Well, fundamentally it's because in our stock market, we have lots of listed companies who are not following the, the rules. Right. And it's hard for them to sue them in the court. Okay. And the court are controlled by local governments in which are protecting the right. local enterprises. Clearly That's the, fundamental problem. Clearly the math doesn't work, does it? You can't have some things going up and some things sinking so fast like that. We'll take that up again uh, right after the break. We'll talk about uh, capital market development. Is China a little bit behind uh, in the curveball? And uh, we are, of course, veering towards a possible, do I dare say, collision course on the political issue, because I think we have some pretty strong opinions on either side. China, the road ahead continues in three minutes.
Welcome back, and thank you very much for staying tuned to China the Road Ahead. Uh, we have really gotten into a pretty uh, heavy-duty discussion here, uh, and we're re-examining the tenets of what is uh, at least a couple years old in the uh, latest 12th uh, five-year plan uh, for China. One point of contention which has emerged in this uh, discussion uh, today is the roadmap may be there. It's like you're driving along, you're not using a GPS, you're actually using an old-fashioned uh, ink-to-paper map, and you know where you're supposed to go, but you actually have various choices and various routes to actually get there. There are different ways to arrive at the same location. Martin, I know you are a very strong proponent that China has an ironclad game plan that you really feel that they're going to stick Yeah, with. I mean, I'm a little bit um, different to class because I do think the 12th five-year plan essentially at its core is about consumption. I mean, I find it somewhat ironic that we're passing judgment on an economy which has moved 200 or 300 million people or more out of poverty into lower middle class or middle class consumption habits within as short a period of time as we've ever seen in economic history. I don't think you can put, found another nation that has gone through it so quickly. But the thing just before the break, the ad break, which I'm delighted that we've had it in such profusion during the course of this hour. But I just want to ask Lee one thing. He's mentioned uh, the development of the judici judiciary. He also mentioned just before the development of the stock exchange. Uh, my experience is that the leadership understands the need for change. For example, when we had the last China Development Forum, which was Wen Jiabao's farewell session with the CDF, he talked about the need for very significant change with the next leadership cadre. Is, is that your belief that the leadership will embrace that change? Sure. Um, and also, let me add that uh, the social conditions perhaps are ripe to push for a new round of reforms. In social media, people are talking about changes. People are complaining about corruption. People are complaining about too much interference by the governments local and central, in the approving process of investments. So these conditions are, are, are ripe. Also, I have strong belief that the younger leaders were educated in the honeymoon years of reform and opening up. That is the year of the years of 77, 78. So I believe that in the new, in, among the new leaders, there's religious belief in reform. Mm -hmm. Without reform, there's no, no way for the country to be successful, whatever defines success, success in the future. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, okay. would give us uh, some hope that the fundamental changes will be will upcoming. Let me also quickly add that the British model of gradual evolution, of gradual improving institutions without undermining the whole system, might be feasible in China. Take, again, the example of stock exchange. But currently, what can be done, I think, easily is to establish a central court in Beijing mm. right, to deal with all the securities exchange issues, problems. Mm. Take it away from local governments. This reform alone, in my opinion, would greatly boost confidence of, among investors, whether abroad or domestic, about our, our corporates. Right. And this reform is fundamentally it's a legal reform. Okay. It's a political reform. Mm -hmm. Arvin, can they do it uh, incrementally rather than with a big bang approach and a lot of drama? See, I, I don't think the question is incremental or big bang. I, I think uh, the question is whether, you know, uh, there is the political willingness to take on the vested interests to, to, to push through reform. Let me give you one example. You know, we all agree that, you know, the financial system needs to be, uh, you know, reformed, right? But that means... Uh, you have to uh, take away some of the privileges that the state-owned banks have. You have to take on those people who benefit from the cheap capital that the state-owned banks provide to the state-owned enterprises. So, so this is a very concrete example of where you need reforms and who the vested interests are. So the question is, you know, can these vested interests be taken on by the new leadership? And what are the kind of costs and benefits and the underlying issues going on? So it's an open question. We don't know what's going to happen. But, but you know, tell us why you think it's likely to happen. Very good question. I would argue that today's calculus of reform is totally different from what it was five years ago. Today, the social media. The social media is so powerful so that the reformist leader can easily rally support from grassroots level mm -hmm. to go against the interest group. 
So that is a new dynamism of reform, which I'm really looking forward to. Mm -hmm. But Kaifu, this is a perfect opening to bring you uh, in here. Uh, I came here from, uh, from Hong Kong, where I work and live, where there has been an uproar mm -hmm. lately. And this is in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. not in the mainland itself, over the concept of national education being included in the school curriculums. I mean, it basically brought the administration to a standstill, and they had to completely uh, do an about turn on that plan to introduce civic education or what people thought was going to be Communist Party mm -hmm. brainwashing. Yeah. Um, the microblogs are getting more and more active. They can shut them down from time to time. They can scurry around. You know, people can close down VPNs. You can force them onto another virtual private network. And, you know, you can, you, you can, you can run mm -hmm. in China and seek cover, but you can stay hidden, too, mm -hmm. in China. I'm kind of wondering, because you, 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 you keep talking about the impact of social media. How, is that going to be a revolution, do you think, in terms of cha making this, these changes in the institutions, in the politics? Well, I, I don't think there will be a revolution. I, I think bad, bad that, word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the role of social media has been phenomenal, and I think Dao agrees with me here, that uh, every intellectual is online and, and is virtually addicted to Weibo, or known as the... Um, the Chinese Twitter, mm -hmm. and that's where most of the intellectuals access information and express opinion. And for those people who think there's no freedom of press in China, actually, uh, people pretty much freely say what they want on, on the Weibo. And yes, occasionally what they say <laughs> don't show up anymore, but, <laughs> but, 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 it's, but largely, largely, um, you, you can say what you want. And it's become a wonderful forum for exchange of information. And I think the government recognizes that and the government has recently allowed Sina Weibo to no longer call that product a beta product, mm -hmm. which means now it's, I would take it as a sign that it's here to stay. And it's, it's something that has to be managed and controlled, uh, not just be let people say every, anything they want. But I think a happy medium will be found. And, and, uh, and I think social media will really create uh, a number of things. First, I think people, uh, the, the majority opinion will be heard and the uh, people ruling the country uh, do and will hear. Mm -hmm. Because uh, while they don't usually, uh, the, the, political, the, the political leaders in China don't usually have Weibo accounts like Obama and others, but most of them uh, are um, uh, using it uh, underwater, you know, qian <laughs> shui. So they're using it just to watch and not to say. Mm -hmm. So they know what's going on. So, and, and I think, you know, the, the ruling party has to be responsible and care about their mandate. So they will watch and listen, and they will figure out which of the many changes to make. Mm -hmm. and, and also agree and the, with that. the important way. thing is they watch and listen very carefully. This may be the engineering background, but they do, they do watch. Our experience has been that they monitor it, yes. the weight of it, and the opinion very carefully. So the, the timing of the Hong Kong demonstrations yeah. are very interesting in that context because with new leadership coming on board, willing to, do, to look at change, it's going to be very interesting to see how they manage. And of course, social media are catalysts for change. They don't create change, mm -hmm. right. they just catalyze it and embolden it. Okay. So, 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 so Bernie, uh, this question I want to ask uh, uh, my Chinese colleagues is that, you know, what you hear very often is that in China, major reforms, like in most parts of the world, uh, happened in response to cr actual or perceived crisis. You know, when you see crisis at hand, you know, change happens. And that's been the history of China as well. Now, uh, is there a sense of crisis now that's going to, along with social media as the catalyst, that's going to trigger change. So is there a sense of crisis? And if so, what is the, what is the crisis, perceived crisis, from the point of view of the party? Okay. Dr. Okay. take that. Take that I don't think they are crisis. However, they are concerns about the crisis. The concerns are so severe that changes will happen. Let me give you an example, right? Uh, about two weeks ago, there was a government official who appeared in a highway accident, and this official for some reason, smiled on camera, right? And he was caught by the social media. And people say, this guy is responsible. Let's see what's going on with his life. It happens to be the guy showed his watch. It happens that he also appeared in other, in other camera on other occasions, right? And they wear, he wore different kinds of expensive watches. Oh. Look, this guy might be corrupt. So this is an ongoing investigation about this guy's behavior. So these kind of mini crises for the governments are actually disciplining the behavior of the officials and the government. 
I think it's a positive force for changes. It is, it is, that is true. Yeah. Can I add just on the Hong Kong situation also and, and the watch situation? So uh, I think the main I- issue, actually I think a lot of people in the government recognize this and I think they want to figure out the change, but the main issue they have is the, that of communication. Uh, many of these people um, don't communicate well. Mm-hmm. The person wearing the watches said, I have five luxury watches, then people found eight more. So now he's uh, not just buying he's really expensive watches, he's lying, right? He's understating his but, wealth. But, but on the Hong Kong case, you know, in the Hong Kong case, mm-hmm. I think, you know, adding a education that you people in Hong Kong are Chinese citizens, here's something to learn about China, I think everyone would say that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. But the way in which it became the textbook Mm -hmm. may not be the best way to explain to a, you know, former British uh, uh, (laughs) Empire, Commonwealth citizen, uh, that this is a one one track way of thinking. So I think if if people will open up and explain things in a more Western accepted way, I think Mm. uh, things can move forward much easier. Yeah, it's uh, protests have become a national pastime. You know, we're very, we're more crowded and we're more more high density in China, uh, in Hong Kong Kong. than China. Yeah, and weekends, nobody, you know, it's so crowded, you know, it's better to sit down in the middle of the government uh, garden and just protest (laughs) against something. (laughs) When we come back, uh, politics and innovation, our final two subtopics as we explore more of China, the road ahead. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the final segment of China, the road ahead. Well, it's actually a very short road the rest of this year with the political transitions going on here in the PRC and, of course, uh, across the Pacific in uh, the United States. Not that often because of the uh, timetables that, uh, you know, you get this convergence of political change. I want to get some final comments from our commentators, our panelists today, on what they see happening. Because we've been talking so far about China inside and the need to change inside, but there's a lot going on outside that's going to affect China and that's going on inside China that's going to affect the outside. Martin. Well, I, I, think, I think we have to adjust, as I tried to indicate before, to China being I mean, a G2 situation, really. Um, and the, the relationship between the United States and China is going to be the critical relationship that we have to cope with. Uh, one would wonder what would happen if, uh, if Romney was to win the presidential election. I mean, there would be checks in Congress because of the House of Representatives will probably be Republican, the Senate will probably be Democrat, so you've got some checks and balances there. Mm. But one would wonder what would happen there. And indeed, uh, under President Obama, I don't think relationships have exactly been warm. In fact, when Jabal 
in our session with him yesterday, referred to the trust level uh, between the U.S. and China not being at the appropriate level or as high a level as he would want it to be. Right. So I think that's the critical relationship. Okay. I think the real big issue, um, or the real big, the really interesting phenomenon has been the rise of China's soft power. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a great student of Chinese history, but what, from what I know, China has not been expansionist from a military point of view, whatever they might be spending as a proportion of GMP mm -hmm. on, on the military. <clears throat> so I don't think it's a, a military threat, but the soft power is very intense. In Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, the, the incursion by the Chinese to secure food and energy resources and stability of supplies has been quite considerable. And that's, I think, very interesting because whilst the U.S. and the U.K. and Western Europe have been focused on Iran, Iraq, and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The Chinese have moved into Africa and Latin America in a constructive way, don't get me wrong, not in a destructive way, mm -hmm. but in a very constructive way, and have looked at what those countries and those regions are looking for and have provided it. And it, it's the interesting thing about America is America deals with its deficit, mm -hmm. which I hope it will do as soon as possible. Okay. It is going to have to establish priorities, mm -hmm. which means that American power overseas part is going to become more limited right. because they will have to choose where they want to exert the influence, okay. which gives the Chinese even more mm -hmm. opportunity and more openings to extend their influence. Okay. So that relationship mm -hmm. between China and the United States, I think, is the critical relationship. Right. Klaus, final thoughts on the political dimension here <laughs> that's at stake. Well, keep in mind, this is election time in the U.S., and the U.S. general population is interested in jobs and the economy, and that's what plays these days. The, most, the least important topic on a list of 10 or so in the U.S. is foreign policy. I think I would see the remarks that have been made in that light. I also believe there is enough intelligence around whoever gets elected to establish a good policy with China understanding that these are the two superpowers and they have to find a way how to deal with each other. Mm -hmm. One component that we haven't talked about mm -hmm. is uh, outside also is outside companies and the Western companies. Western companies have played a large role and the Chinese government has been very, very, in the build-up of the last 20 years, Chinese government has been very intelligent on bringing companies in. I think that has to also continue to play a role uh, in restructuring the, the, the industry. I mean, we see it in our industry Two-thirds of the energy that we use for producing aluminum is hydropower. Mm. It's totally clean, you know, and very, very cheap. There are other opportunities on this planet where one can, can build uh, aluminum smelters with hydropower. Mm. We don't have to build it here mm. with 100% coal-fired and continue to pollute the environment and use the resources in an effective way. Technology, to bring, the, to bring the industry up in many, many areas, value at industries, there is technology needed. Technology that's currently not here, mm -hmm. Western companies have to continue to, to, to help there. The real critical resource there for mm -hmm. China is the openness and the capabilities of companies here right. to cooperate outside of China, mm -hmm. to have an, a mentality mm -hmm. to understand what, how to do this, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I think that is currently the biggest bottleneck. Okay, uh, okay just a quick comment on where, how you think politics is going to sort itself out. Well, uh, well uh, as I already mentioned, domestically, I think it's critical for us to see in the coming three to five years whether the new leaders will be able to rally the grassroots support for reform to go against interest groups, therefore to push out a new round of institutional reforms, the domestic homework. Right. Internationally, mm -hmm. there's also homework to be done. That is, leaders from China have to explain very explicitly, very clearly, in a very articulate way to the external world, especially the Western countries, mm -hmm. the intention, the future, of China in the world, mm -hmm. right? China's strategic intention. Right? Without explaining this, the Western countries tend to use its colonial past to project the future of China, mm -hmm. and therefore cause a new round of containment on right. China, mm -hmm. and which in turn can e very easily stoke the fire of ultra-nationalism. Right. Okay. So that's, I, I think, that's homework carved out for our leaders. Yeah, and it doesn't help when you see all these island disputes and every, all, this, uh, all these overlapping By the way, all the claims, claims are yeah. old claims. There's no yeah. new claims. Okay. okay. <laughs> Been going that's true. For years. Yeah, they're 30 years old, right? Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Arvind, go ahead. And then Kai Fu, finally. So, so I, I think, um, you know, history teaches us that all tra such transitions of superpower status tend to be 
difficult uh, and even conflictual in some instances. And I think this one hopefully will be less conflictual than before. But I think uh, Martin is absolutely right in saying that it's a G2 that's very important. But the real danger is that uh, uh, if China, on the one hand, does not kind of play its part in maintaining you know, the current rules of the game, because it says it's, you know, it's too poor. Mm -hmm. you know, Deng Xiaoping said, for example, China must lie low for 50 years before challenging the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think China, uh, China can afford to do that. So, so China has its own role to play. The U.S. on its part, and again, Martin was alluding to that, I think the U.S. has a fundamental problem in getting used to the fact that it is now a declining power, mm -hmm. and therefore to manage China as a declining power is a mindset that the U.S. has not come to grips with. So if China doesn't you know, take on its responsibilities in its own self-interest, mm -hmm. and if the U.S. doesn't allow this transition to pan out in a kind of way, the big uh, danger is that we get a G2, which is like a G0, with no one in control. Mm -hmm. And we saw the interwar years mm -hmm. when the same superpower transition, a declining UK, an ascendant US not willing to take on the responsibility, and we saw what happened then. That G0 is what we need to avoid going forward. Arvin, you're, you're going to give me sleepless nights the way you're talking, you know? <laughs> you're just pressing me here. Kaipo, <laughs> last, last word here. Yeah, I think there are a lot of challenges ahead between the U.S. and China relationship and trust. I mean, historically, very rarely has two top superpowers really got along for a win-win situation. And this pair of countries is further confounded by three major additional issues, more than perhaps countries in the past, superpowers in the past. One is um, a perceived ideological difference. And um, a, a second one is um, a la really lack of fundamental understanding. For example, not seeing how China could have moved so fast when the U.S. hasn't moved so fast. And the third one, also perhaps very damaging, is uh, uh, media sensationalism. Right? Both sides of the media want to say bad things about the other. So I think it's hard to come up with any solutions mm -hmm. uh, on the fly, but I suggest two things. Uh, one is in terms of communication and letting journalists really go in deep, the responsible journalists go in deep and report more responsible content and, and encourage more and proper communication in a way the other side can understand. Uh, the other suggestion is, uh, is on business mm -hmm. and finance, mm -hmm. really create a more open level playing field for the other country to come in and play, whether there's a Chinese company listing in the U.S. without getting ridiculous attacks right. or an American company being able to come into China. I hope it's only a matter, a short matter of time before uh, leaders of China finally sign up and get their Weibo accounts <laughs> and start using them. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been a, uh, an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure thank you. talking to all of you. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to China, The Road Ahead. I'm Bertie Lowe, signing out here in Tianjin, China.